what stood out to me is um, how like driven everyone is to get better on the team. An influx of freshmen is leading our Lady of the Lake track and field to new heights in big board sports. Ping pong balls will be bouncing around in Chicago tonight and they'll determine the fate of the Spurs, Rockets and the Pistons who will have a 14% chance to land the number one overall draft pick in the June draft. Spurs managing partner Peter J. Holt is in the Windy City to represent the team. Now the actual lottery procedure will take place in a separate room just before ESPN's national broadcast at 7. Select the media, NBA officials and representatives of the participating teams and the accounting firm Ernst & Young will be in attendance for the drawings. Here are the Spurs draft draft lottery possibilities 14 percent to land the top pick and then it drops them there until the sixth pick where the Spurs really have the best chance at 26 percent. The WNBA is rescinding lead Las Vegas Aces 2025 draft pick and suspending head coach Becky Hammond for two games without pay the league announced today. The punishment comes after investigation by the league determined that the Aces violated league rules regarding impermissible player benefits and workplace policies. Plus former Aces player Derek Hamby alleged she was bullied and manipulated manipulated for being pregnant and that it led to her being traded to the LA Sparks. Hammond allegedly made negative comments to Hamby about her pregnancy. Philadelphia 76ers fired head coach Doc Rivers following a third straight exit in the second round of the playoffs. Rivers led the 76ers to their second straight 50-win season behind NBA MVP Joel Embiid, but again failed to lead them to the Eastern Conference Finals or beyond. Miami Heat head coach Eric Spolstra was blown away by the news. Yeah, it's, it's disturbing. I mean, Ducks are a Hall of Famer. You know, you get past the first round, there's going to be some really good teams, great players, great organizations, great coaching staffs. They're going to lose just by the nature of this, this beast. I mean, there's only so many teams that can advance. Spolstra and his Heat advance to face the Celtics in the Eastern Conference Finals that begin tomorrow night in Boston. Our Lady of the Lake is home to one of the best track and field teams in the NAIA. The Saints are currently ranked sixth in the nation in the Outdoor Track Index, thanks in part to a young core of 28 freshmen and 51 total underclassmen on both the men's and women's teams that have made an instant impact. The men won the Red River Athletic Conference Championship, while the women finished as conference runners-up. Now they're looking to finish their season with a strong showing at Nationals next week. Well, I'm very excited. I'm excited to have more men on our team, too. I remember last year it was just us females going in a four by one. So I was very excited to not only go to nationals again, but also PR going into that. You know, our team has gotten bigger this year, so it's just very exciting. Coming up to college and having a team where, you know, it's not just competitive on the local conference level, we're competitive on the national level, looking to even possibly podium at nationals. That's a really amazing feeling because I know that all of us and the guys here have put in a ton of hard work and just being able to see the fruits of our labor is something that I really, you just can't replace. The outdoor championships begin on May 24th at Indiana Westland and we'll have more on the team tonight on the night beat. Including where the Spurs will be drafting. Yes. Mm -hmm. And if RJ got his tablet. Fingers paper. crossed. Sorry, I'm yeah. holding a tablet. It's hard. If RJ Marquez gets it. <laughs> RJ Marquez better it's deliver. Tab of Diet Coke paid for. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Larry. Our KSAP Q&A with Mayor Ron Nirenberg is next. There was a dangerous dog attack just this weekend in town. As a matter of fact, earlier in this newscast, we reported about some dogs being taken away as part of that investigation. And since the deadly dog attack earlier this year, there have been a number. It is tripled with the number of dangerous dog reports that have been sent in to animal care services. Mayor Ron Nuremberg joined us now. And uh, yeah, I know that the city council's made some changes when it comes to dangerous dogs and how animal care services responds. Talk a little bit about those changes and if what how you are viewing some of these numbers that we're seeing. Sure. Well, there has been an increase in dangerous dog calls, I think largely because of the public awareness after the tragedy that occurred on the west side of San Antonio earlier this year. Uh, the, the animal care services has shifted resources to really uh, start going after uh, you know, loose and roaming dogs that present a danger to the public. And so you're seeing that activity. I would say the greatest change, though, uh, there's a couple of pieces of legislation that will allow it, uh, us uh, a little bit more flexibility in investigating uh, and seizing dangerous animals after they have, uh, you know, bitten somebody. 
Um, but the other big change that's occurring is we actually now have a new strategic plan for animal care services. And so I'll be advocating along with a number of my colleagues for increased services that or increased resources to go ahead and execute that plan uh, in, in a couple of stages. One is to make sure that we do have more resources and officers out on the street to control the loose uh, animal population. Um, and you're already seeing those folks go through the pipeline. We're getting a head start through training new animal care officers. We're also working to ensure that there is, uh, we get back to um, lowering our euthanasia rates by having responsible pet ownership. So more spay and neuter resources, you're gonna see some of that on the agenda this week. Uh, but also, again, making sure that we have an appropriate uh, level of service that helps transfer uh, uh, strays that have been caught to places that might need more for adoption services. So there's a number of things that we're working on in animal care to keep the public safe and also make sure that we have a, a healthy uh, pet population in San Antonio. It sounds like there's an effort to really keep tabs on that, a stray animal population. You touched on this a little bit, but what about penalties for owners that are not following the rules? They, they may have dogs that are loose or aggressive. What about something that really makes sure that the owners are facing some sort of penalty for that? Yeah, and, and that's part, the, part of where we are looking forward to possibly having some of this legislation passed. It's been uh, filed by our own Bear County delegation, but that is largely governed by state statute. Now, where it does help is when these reports are, are filed. We do an investigation, and in many cases, these animals are seized. In fact, that you saw that happen uh, this week already with a couple of dog bites that occurred. And when those animals are seized, if they're determined to be a danger to the public, they are euthanized. But uh, again, a lot of this has to uh, be meted out at the state level because pets are considered private property, uh, but we're getting a lot more flexibility and we're again, we're putting a lot more resources into ensuring that we are getting at this issue of loose and, ro loose and dangerous roaming animals and then following up on investigations that happen at the local level. I wanna talk about something different that is happening at the state level, a so-called preemption bill, a piece of legislation that made its way through the Senate, approved there. So that would essentially ban cities from creating rules or regulations that preempt what exists at the state level. You've been outspoken against this, quoted as saying it's undemocratic in, in a lot of ways. What would that mean for San Antonio, for city leaders like yourself, if this gets the governor's signature? And, and, and sure, and let's be really clear. S local city laws do not preempt state law. And it's very clear when a city has a constitution that's voted on by the public, uh, and ours was established in 1952, that the state constitution allows for cities to create rules and regulations that their community wants in those areas that are not covered by the state. These pieces of legislation, which are called super preemption bills, are those that would say that wherever the state doesn't expressly say it's okay to govern, a city, a local community cannot, and therefore upends the intent and essentially the entire reading of a city charter disenfranchising local voters that have put this charter in place and have had it in place for you know 80 plus years so um, it's it's been a challenge to see some of this it's it's sort of the climax of an ongoing uh war that that the state uh, state government has had on local cities around texas for a number of years this is some of the most far-reaching legislation that we've ever, ever seen and the effects of that are a little bit unknown. The only thing we know for sure is that there's probably going to be a lot of litigation uh, that, that comes from local and state level throughout our state and, and Texas over the next several years if these things pass. But what we do know is it calls into question our ability to do things like uh, control for excessive noise, keep from you know uh, large vehicles from parking in front of your house. We wouldn't be able to do those sorts of things. Um, regulate predatory lending. There's a lot of things that, that local communities do through their city charters that would be now preempted, prevented, prohibited by this kind of state legislation. So, again, this is not uh, this is not at all what our state constitution intends. 
And uh, that's the message that we're trying to get to our legislators who have our ear on this. So basically, a lot of what decisions made for San Antonio will be made in Austin. Essentially, if you ever have an, a local issue you're trying to deal with under these pieces of legislation, you have to go and work work uh, your state legislators, and they only meet for 114 days every two years. So if you got a local issue, uh, you're, you're going to have to really endure that and see if you can get something past the state level. That's the reading generally of what they're trying to do up there is centralize all of this stuff, uh, local issues at the state level. All right, Mr. Mayor, I cannot let you go. I know you're a sports fan without talking about the draft lottery tonight. A lot on the line. The Spurs know they will draft no lower than seventh, but of course they could draft first. But we did a story earlier about people lighting candles, people doing, you know, crossing their fingers, various things. Will you be watching the draft lottery tonight? And do you have a superstition that you're going to carry out? No superstitions, but I, I will say we're, we're putting as much good energy out there into the universe for the Spurs as we possibly can. Uh, we know the Spurs have been a gift to sports, and I got to think that the, the sports gods will, will uh, look favorably upon the Spurs just for that tradition and history. I will say, though, I am wearing all silver and black today. In fact, a <laughs> silver and black tie that, that's from France because we know that the uh, object of everyone's desire in the NBA right now is is uh, sitting in uh, France. All right, whoa, 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 whoa. You said you have no superstitions, <laughs> but you're wearing silver and black and you have from a tie France. from France? It's, it's not a superstition, Steve. I'm just uh, I'm just doing what I can to support. Uh, I don't know. It seems a little superstitious you to me. You an office fan? I'm not superstitious, just a little stitious. <laughs> <laughs> Mayor Ron Rurberg, appreciate your time. Go Spurs, go. Thank there you, you go. Absolutely. We'll be right back. President Joe Biden and Congress's top four leaders meeting again today at the White House to try and hash out a deal to raise the debt ceiling. The talks coming as Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen sends another stark warning about what's at stake if the government runs out of money to pay its bills in just over two weeks. ABC's M. Wynn has the latest from Washington. As the June 1st debt limit deadline nears, President Joe Biden and top congressional leaders meeting at the White House for the second time in a week in a pivotal face-to-face -face talk. We're having a wonderful time. Everything's going well. <laughs> Ahead of the high-stakes meeting, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen reiterating how the nation could sink into another recession if Congress doesn't raise the debt limit. A U.S. default would generate an economic and financial catastrophe. Yellen also warning in a new letter to House Speaker Kevin McCarthy, the uncertainty leading up to a potential default could cause serious harm to business and consumer confidence and raise short-term borrowing costs for taxpayers. In fact, she says the Treasury's borrowing costs have already increased substantially for securities maturing in early June. The U.S. economy hangs in the balance. But while the president has expressed optimism they're closer to making a deal, McCarthy is accusing Biden of not taking the negotiations seriously. McCarthy says any deal must include tighter work requirements for recipients of federal aid programs like food stamps and Medicaid, which the White House and Democrats say are non-starters. Republicans are also pushing to impose budget caps and claw back unused COVID-19 funds. The one thing I do know is that the House Republicans have acted. We need the Democrats to now start taking it seriously. On the Senate floor, Majority Leader Chuck Schumer has blamed McCarthy for refusing to take a government default off the table, warning if that happens, Social Security payments would halt, troops would go unpaid, and nearly 8 million people could lose their jobs. If you want to own a home one day, Default would take that dream and run it through the shredder. June 1st is just over two weeks away, but congressional lawmakers actually have less time than that to pass a debt limit bill, since they're due to leave for Memorial Day recess this weekend, ramping up pressure on the president, McCarthy, and other congressional leaders to reach a deal as soon as possible. In Washington, M. Wynn, ABC News. A scary scene at a youth baseball game over the weekend. A seven-year-old catcher was engulfed by a short-lived dust devil yesterday afternoon. This was in Jacksonville, Florida. You can see that sand and debris spiraled around the kiddo for a few seconds before the 17-year-old umpire rescued him. Yeah, didn't the dust didn't stop him, though, from playing. His dad poured water on him to get the dirt out of his eyes. 
and he went back into the game. Unfortunately, his team didn't end up winning the three game tournament, but you see him right there, just caught like right in the middle of that dust devil. That's crazy. And he was right back at it. You, yep. you know what I love when you drive I-10 west of San Antonio in the summertime? Mm. You get out there where you can see just so far and you see these dust devils spinning up. I've counted yeah. six at one time within oh. view. Super cool. Dust devils, fascinating. Just caused by the intense heat, usually in like more of a desert climate in the afternoon. Anyway, this evening, a few lingering showers after sunset, but I do think give it an hour or two after sunset and it's all going to be over with. Then a calm wind and even partial clearing by midnight. And you look at the trend on the radar right now, the rain is slowly breaking up and dissipating. These showers and storms starting to rain themselves out and it's starting to gradually wrap up. Not necessarily the case in Gonzales County and Lavaca County and points eastward. Still some ongoing storms, but with the loss of daytime heating and the sun setting, it's going to be hard to maintain these showers and thunderstorms. We're going to take a look at lake levels and much more along with our next chance of storms right around the corner in just a bit. Saw some good rain this evening. Question is, any more throughout the night, Adam? No, I really think this is going to be wrapping up here in the next few hours, and then it's going to be quiet the rest of the night. We can just let this rain soak in and even drain, continue to drain in some areas. Around San Antonio, it's slowly coming to an end and tapering off. It's a gradual process, but it's happening. You get southwest of San Antonio, Dimmit, LaSalle, McMullen counties, and that's where we have some pockets of heavy rain. Obviously, a lot of lightning with that, too, down here. From Crystal City to Carrizo Springs, some scattered activity, but especially spreading eastward into Catula and right along I-35, then even eastward, closer to Tilden. That's where we have those downpours. Now they're moving away from Atascosa County. Closer to home here, the rain that we have, as I mentioned, starting to really taper off. You get up into the hill country and notice that shield of rain after the thunderstorms really shrinking right now and getting smaller and smaller. It's raining itself out and then we'll have some partial clearing later on tonight, but still a little bit of lightning and thunder up in northern Kendall County. I don't expect this to last much longer as it drifts into Blanco County and around Canyon Lake. We've seen the rain slowly end with just this light, light activity left over along 46 between 281 and I-35. And then around town, just a little bit left in the northeast side of town where we've already tallied up around two inches along I-35, but that's slowly ending. The main action is off to the east. Some of our eastern counties, Gonzales, Lavaca, it's still going. You still have the heavy rainfall and we're seeing that building northward. I'd give this action another couple of hours. Uh, east of San Antonio, whereas locally it's really coming to an end. We'll take a look at some of the rainfall accumulations on the night beat tonight once it's all wrapped up. But here's the big picture and you see those showers flaring up and a few thunderstorms in South Texas. Remember yesterday I was talking about our swirly, whirly weather pattern, a very unique weather pattern. Well, that upper level high, the blocking high is now over Florida. It's moved eastward, so it's breaking down. That's going to open up the flow. No more block in our atmosphere. It's going to open it up and that's going to get rid of our storm chances. 10% tomorrow, then 0% Thursday and Friday. By the weekend, we see another shift in our pattern and we're looking at isolated to widely separated showers and storms. Here's a look at the this is the Julia Yates Sems Library this afternoon near Comanche Lookout Park. Nacogdoches Road just inside 1604. Clearly some high water there within the drainage areas. And we've got the drainage ditch Shirts Parkway and Live Oak Road. So seeing the aftermath out there from that heavy rain. You'd think, yes, this would be great for our area reservoirs and you know, Canyon 76% full right now. That's 12 feet below the conservation pool. Medina is still at 5% capacity. Medina is such a small watershed. It takes a lot of rain in a very specific spot to really boost Medina Lake Reservoir. 69 right now. Dew point is 66. Still wet outside, but will be drying out. And tomorrow, partly cloudy. 65 in the morning, high temperature of 87. Then it's sunny and near 90 Thursday and Friday before we cool off a little bit low 80s this weekend with another chance of showers and storms. All right, thanks, Adam. We'll be right back. The man accused of shooting his ex-wife and stabbing his two children appeared in court today. Stephen Clare is charged with capital murder for allegedly killing his 11-month-old daughter. 
He's still in jail with bonds up to $2 million. His next hearing is scheduled for later this week. Animal Control Services removed three dogs today from a home on Hartford Avenue that are believed to have attacked a man sending him to the hospital this weekend. ACS said if a judge decides the man's injuries are severe enough, the dogs won't simply be designated as dangerous. They'll be put down. Tonight, police are investigating a shooting at a Whataburger on South New Braunfels Avenue. Witnesses told officers the man had a gun in each hand. Officers say the suspect seemed to be firing at random into the air and into the sidewalk. The suspect was taken into custody. The San Antonio police also investigating a shooting on Castroville Road. Officers say two people in a stolen vehicle were shot. At last check, one of them in critical condition. Police have not said where the allegedly stolen vehicle came from and no information on the shooter has been released. That's your 60 second recap. Thanks for watching the news at six. See you back here on the night beat at 10. When that draft spurs.